I will just give a brief introduction of uh, Kalyan Raman. As such, he doesn't need introduction. He has taken several sessions. But for the people who may be joining first time or after a long time, uh, Kalyan is a veteran as such in project industry. I'm working with him almost now 20 years as such. In fact, as old as I am a PMP actually. So I did the PMP and joined, uh, after a certain time, I joined P PMI Mumbai chapter, where I find him. And, uh, and since then, we are working together, started with creating a PMP club a, for Mumbai chapter. It was a very interesting uh, assignment or interesting venture as such, I will say which turned out to be very successful and very useful for the chapter. And uh, uh, since then I'm working with him and very closely on many things. He has been, uh, especially the, this, this topic of today, that is PM Walk, uh seventh edition. In fact, Kalyan has the strong hold on PM Box since uh, I think version second second version or maybe if it is not second it was third version. So since then on a continuously revising uh, revisions he has participated in those revisions reviewing those uh, revisions uh, one after another he has been very various voluntary or voluntary positions he has been on the ethic committee ethics committee of the global PMI actually for two terms, almost six years. And uh, before he was in ethics committee of PMI's Mumbai chapter as well, and did a fantastic job there. He has a very strong hold on PM, on PM Bok. Very, he has seized the evolution of, of PM Bok from uh, like second edition, third edition, fourth, fifth, sixth, and now the seventh. And that's a true right person to speak on any version of PM Bob as such. So Kalyan, uh, so over you, please uh, enlighten us on this. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for your kind introduction. Hope I am audible now to all. Yes, very much, very good. I saw a message that somebody couldn't hear. Uh, so. your okay, welcome is... all of you. Another interesting session of the project managers club of pune kalyan before you continue i will say just try out once with the with the uh, mic of laptop itself without this attachment just try out once if that doesn't work then probably we can utilize the hello can you hear me now yes we can hear you you Maybe can hear us some background noise, that's why. You can hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. I Thanks. think this is better actually, uh, because you have to hold it in your hand first of all, and then uh, it sometimes it give a humming noise as, as such. Okay, if this is bearable, we'll continue. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a much better. So once again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my views on uh, this subject. And uh, first disclaimer, let me tell all our participants here that it is a, it's our perspective and it's our view about what is the improvements and what are the changes which have brought it. I would be referring a lot from the PM Box 7th edition itself, but uh, the interpretation is ours as to what benefits, what changes have come through and how this uh, book has evolved over the last so many years. Okay, let's deep dive into it now. So if many of you would, recall that we did a session a couple of months ago around the journey of project management, the evolution of project management over the last uh, five decades. And we also touched upon some of the standards which are available in the world. So as a, a logical step, I suggested let's deep dive into one of those uh, certifications. And that's where we chose project uh, PMI's um, PM Box 7 as the uh, subject for today. Now I'm starting off from that context. So today, if you see, there are multiple certifications available as a project manager. 
and um, some of them are listed here. The source is uh, CIO.com. You can see many of them listed there. The more common ones are Prince2, the BVOP, and um, IAPM certifications, which are offered in addition to PMI uh, certifications around ACP, CAPM, and PMP. And many universities and organizations, I mean organizations, large multinational organizations, have also developed their own curriculum, uh, bringing in the best practices from various sources. So that's also an option which many of you, if you are employed in some organizations, you may relate to it. So what is the benefit of doing this exercise? PMI has been you know, vocal about project management, promoting it strongly over the last uh, 55 plus years now. And uh, the good part about it is it has been evolving. They have understood the importance of uh, evolution, keep change, change is constant, and therefore they have been evolving it and making it better and relevant to the current context. That's where I, I feel connected with it and I'll be talking, sharing my views about it. So the review process for PMI is, uh, is a four year process. And they publish this standard uh, every fourth year, except the exception has been the COVID year last year. Otherwise, it would have been done on time. And uh, they, the, I like the review process which they do. They set up a development team, and then they involve the entire PMI community. I mean, the, the members, the practitioners, and the global community to contribute to the development of the standard. And there is a robust process of at least two years it goes through before the next version is released. As we speak, they will launch the next revisions process in the in the next coming year. By the end of this year, you will see that announcements if people are tracking the PMI website. So historically, if you see the PMI standard, uh, PMI, PMBOK first edition was released in 1987 and uh, it was a highly process driven standard. The documents were all written primarily to adopt certain processes and uh, focus on documentation. So it's natural because those times we were talking about the predictive models of delivery. We were talking about the waterfall delivery model and uh, the agreement, uh, the best practices known at that time was you need to do things in a sequential way. So to keep track of those things, process adaption and uh, not only adoption, but compliance to processes was uh, very highly valued. So that was the first edition which they released. Subsequent inputs and um, feedback from the community, they added the human uh, dimensions aspect around it. When we say the human dimension, that is the, the HR processes, the people aspect of project management, which is also very important. As a project manager, each one of you would relate to it, that you deal with people throughout the life cycle of a project. So you need to understand how do you manage the nuances? How do you handle the most unpredictable resource in the project. So those things came into, uh, as got added into the standard. Then later, after two editions, they uh, focused on getting it, publishing it as a standard, and then they collaborated with the American National Standards Institute. And now we have a standard for project management, which is also part of the PMBOK document, which gets published. So, the bigger changes have happened significantly over the last 10 years because of the inputs, continuous feedback which they get. They have realized that process-based solutions will not work anymore. So they have now moved uh, towards a different model altogether. The initial steps were seen in the earlier sixth edition when we saw Agile being introduced and getting adopted in, in a small way in, uh, in the PMBOK documents. But in seventh edition, we see now a significant change. So those changes is what we, I will help you walk through those things. So the first important observation, if you see, is the, the prescriptive nature of the standard has been done away with now and uh, uh, focuses on deliverables earlier. There used to be always an input output documents and the, the outputs were highly focused upon earlier, that the outputs of one process would definitely be an input for the subsequent uh, workflows. And uh, so the completion of the deliverable was very important. Now that change has happened. Now they are not talking so much about it. The reasons for it, what drives these changes there? One of the important changes has been the pervasive presence of information technology products now, the software influence in, in all walks of life. 
in all industries you see today uh, it systems are in place whether it is simple complex or large it systems are already in place now this enables you to leverage the communication workflow more effectively and more in a real time basis i'll, I'll talk about it in a couple of minutes the more important the other big change has been the evolving business models it's no longer the the bureaucratic large sized businesses which only do project management project management is now relevant to all sizes of business could be right from a startup to a, an ngo to a service to a government organization and even public and private sectors joint ventures then the third big change has been the adoption of agile or adaptive delivery services processes across all organizations and across all walks of life there has been recognition now that we can't be relying only on the sequential flow of work and waiting upon decisions to be taken we need to be nimble we need to be moving really fast and uh, one of the big aids for that has been the communication in the if you reflect back in the process based systems the the block bottleneck has been the the flow of communication there was always a delay in information flowing from step a to b b to c and further whereas now with information technology playing a big role this information is now made available lot of tools and aids are now made available that info is always information is more like a pull mode rather than the push mode now so you need to pick up the right information you need to go and decide what is right for you you may come across uh, too much information at some point of time so that is the change big change which has happened so to accommodate all those changes and to be aligned with these new models pmi made a significant changes in the current edition so the first thing they did away with is all the process based working they have now moved to something called as a broad based and a higher level thinking what's called as a principles based of working the second change has been not just on the outputs they are focusing on outcomes now this outcomes is linked to the value chain the systems uh, delivery model nowadays when we talk about projects we don't talk about uh, what is the output of this project what is the objective of this project if you look at it we talk about the outcome what is the final outcome what is the value addition of this project to the performing organization and to the other stakeholders involved in the project so when we look at this perspective we are now talking about not just the smaller size of a project or the activity which you are doing we are talking about the social impact and the economic impact of that particular project how is what is the value being added the value could be different for different people for you as a project manager the value could be the successful outcome whatever you are talking about the product final product which you are delivering out of that project for the customer is what do they leverage out of this because what you deliver as the final thing may not be the final one for the customer it could be the input for him or something else so how valuable is it for them for the society side of it what how does it add value to the environment or to the society so that is the focus now being driven by pmi in this new edition so we just talked about information flow so i am just giving you a picture this is taken from the pm box book itself to highlight the focus which they are lying talking about here so what do they show here now they show here the uh, the strong communication and the information flow which should happen across all levels now where do you fit in in this depends upon your role typically you would be here in the programs and the projects environment most of us and you may hand over when the project goes live you may hand over to operations and you on the left side you may be part of the portfolio a larger portfolio but definitely you are reporting to your senior management that's the senior leadership so you can see here the communication at all levels is now integrated very well and this facilitates uh, providing real time information flow and quicker decision making and um, more importantly transparency in working across all levels so this is one of the drivers for the change in thought process now the there is a, this is a summary picture which talks about the big shift from 6th edition to 7th edition 
and uh, I will, I'll talk about some of these as we elaborate on those. So many of you, if you have gone through the sixth edition of PMBOK, you would see they were all grouped by knowledge areas. So there were some 10 knowledge areas which we talked about, which a project manager needs to be aware of. And they were all built around the five process groups. These five process groups are iterative and they would be running continuously across the project life cycle. Now, if you take a look at the right side of the picture, it talks about the changes happening across the standard for project management. If you see the bottom A versus B on the right side, those five process groups are no longer visible. Now. They have moved it to something called as system for value delivery and they have identified 12 basic principles for project management. So we will get into each one of that into detail. And the second part is the, the guide. So what is the change in the guide now? The knowledge areas have been replaced. The 10 knowledge areas have been done away with and they have replaced it with eight performance domains. So these are the domains in which the project manager and the team work, the performing organization or the unit delivers their projects supported by two, three aspects there, which is tailoring, models, methods, and artifacts. Now, one of the biggest um, improvements, if you say, in the seventh edition is something called as the PMI Standards Plus. So, I assume at least 50% of the audience here do browse through PMI org and uh, are aware of what it is. So PMI Standards Plus is a very robust digital platform which has been launched by PMI and uh, which not only hosts a lot of resources which are pretty valuable for us, they also host experiences from the practitioners, not just the theory part of it. People, there are snippets, there are recordings, video recordings of people's experiences, challenges, how they've managed, how did they overcome those challenges? And very importantly, the glossary, which is made available live. So this is very interesting because uh, earlier we were all struggling for information. Now the information is absolutely available to anybody who is a member of PMI. I will try and showcase this for you uh, as we go along live version of it, but I have captured a couple of screenshots to show you what is uh, the content there. First, let me show you that part. So this is the screen, home screen, which you see when you log on to PMI Standards Plus. If you are a member, you get to see your login and you also can see importantly, your recent page visits, what all topics you screen, you can browse through the whole um, library there. For example, here, I picked up the standards and guides resources. It shows me all the standards which are published and available for the members. I can click open any of it right away here. Now, I don't have to go searching for anything. This is a, typically a portal which is made available. The best part is the, the, the search part of it, the filtering part here in this particular if you need to find a meaning for any word or any term which is used or the jargon which we talk about in PMI, you need to just put that search here in this portal. It will search across all these artifacts, not restricted to any one. It will throw up the results across the entire library which is made available. So that is the best part which they have done. And this is an ever growing and evolving portal. So that is the, uh, I would say this is the best part which you should leverage. Yeah, there is a comment here about um, process-based uh, working. Uh, I would beg to differ there. Yes, largely they are still process-based. Construction industries are still process-based is the comment. But if you see there also, they are adopting more agile ways of working now. And they are also evolving as to how they can move things faster. So that is what we call normally as the hybrid ways of working which happens, where you cannot do away with your process-based working. Uh, due to certain circumstances, you need to look at uh, using the hybrid model where you pick the best practices available from your um, waterfall methodology and see how you can speed up the execution part by adopting agile practices. Kalyan, uh, probably one of the reason construction industries have not uh, adopted uh, agile approach 
could be they have not yet gone uh, towards the seventh edition of PM book. That could be one of the reason. Uh, I am not worried primarily about you know PM book or any other standard. For example, if for to help help my colleague to understand better, if you go through Prince Two website also, Prince Two is a competitive certification there. Today you will see Prince Two Agile is also a certification now. So they have also largely adopted Agile already. Many of them are adopting those Agile practices. It's not just limited to PMI. So the idea here is how quickly you evolve. So each industry has got their own pace of working. So. it depends upon how quickly they see value in it and they adopt it um, in the in the world today which we see it world has adopted agile much faster than the others that's the only thing but i would also say if you look at the manufacturing space the word agile may not have been used but there are other methods and things which they have put in place which are very close to agile only which are similar to agile um, if you if you look at the japanese uh, kaizen model what was that all about finally you changed from a supplier model to a customer centric model that means you are listening to the voice of the customer and you are tuning yourself to that so that is the primary premise of agile you need to listen to all your stakeholders and bring all of them together and see how i can deliver value early in the system in the life cycle that is the goal of agile so in construction if you see i think vivek can share a few examples he talked about in a couple of earlier sessions i recall where nowadays model homes are being built and then what is the benefit of that model home they allow you to tailor it also based upon your requirements as and when the construction progresses so what is that example fine why they earlier they could have just built some uh, houses for you and told you that was the only thing available there were no options for you today today the world has changed you see improvements happening so that is one example of how things are moving along uh, how thing, businesses are evolving uh, more customer centric and focus on individual customer not just the community of customers i hope that answers some of their questions so we were talking about pmi standards plus so i i urge all of you to just take a look at it because i see this as the the biggest asset which has been created by pmi in a long long time So earlier they used to have a lot of uh, resources available but they were all uh, in a discrete form and uh, not connected now they have made this portal which really adds value so now let's deep dive into those principles which were being talked about which i shown a few minutes ago so what are those primary principles so they have defined 12 principles for uh, as the basis for your successful project management what are those things so the first one he talks about is being a diligent respectful and a caring steward now what is the meaning of a steward is what they have elaborated a bit for each one of them so here stewardship means it's not just being custodian it's being responsible and accountable uh, for you for your team for yourself as well as for your organization so within and outside the performing organization that means you take full ownership of the assignment or of the engagement which you are responsible for the second aspect which they are looking for is the integrity trustworthiness and compliance so compliance is a big big thing now so compliance across multiple regulatory standards multiple uh, government standards in addition to your own organizational uh, metrics which you may have to fulfill so all in all together what they are asking us to do as a project manager expectation here is to take a holistic approach not just on the technical aspects of the project look at it from a larger view take a big picture so what could that big picture include your social aspects the sustainable factors the financial aspects of your project and in short talking relating to that key word which they talk about as value delivery value delivery systems is the key word in pmi now so take an approach to that level and if you start aligning to it from the early stages of your project then only life becomes easier otherwise taking corrective actions halfway down the project life cycle becomes very difficult so this is the first principle on which um, the entire book has been written the second one is creating a collaborative team environment 
Now, here is an exception, is an acceptance that your team does not work alone. Your project team does not survive alone, cannot achieve success. So you need to be collaborative across the board. Not just your team your or your diverse skills, which we talk about in Agile. That's not the one aspect. The first line talks about the Agile model, where you have diverse skills, knowledge, and experience. You bring all of them together always for delivering projects. More importantly, looking outside, because nowadays it's all about outsourcing, working with other vendors. Vendor relationships are a big, big picture today, not just working in-house. You don't deliver everything in-house nowadays. Almost 40% 40, 40 of the work is outsourced nowadays. So learning to work together with the global talent, with the global vendors, is for collaboration. The third aspect is effectively engaging with stakeholders. Now this, I need not talk much about it. I believe all of you understand stakeholders because that has been a key subject across all the editions. So proactive engagement of stakeholders across uh, the entire life cycle is always a success, is a key driver for success. Then focus on value. So we just talked about value creation and addition should always be on the radar. You can't ignore this at any point of time. And if you need it, you need to realign. You may have to take corrective course, uh, corrective actions based upon changes in the environment, changes in customer requirements, or maybe in your social changes which could happen in the society or the environment in which you are delivering. So that is the meaning around it. So please, uh, you may post questions uh, as I go along because these are the, uh, you're free to ask questions in between. Now, the fifth principle talks about recognizing, evaluating, and respond to system interactions. This means you need to be nimble and you need to be smart throughout. More importantly, how do you manage the risks? That is the key factor here. How do you be sensitive to the risks around you? And how do you convert those threats into opportunities? And how do you make them work towards the benefit of the project rather than detrimental to the project. That is the goal. Now, the sixth aspect is uh, the, the human aspect, which we, talk, which we highlighted earlier, demonstrating leadership behaviors. So what does this mean here? Le what is the distinction between a manager and a leader? I think we had a session earlier, we talked about it. So here, demonstrating, so the manager is somebody who looks at from a process compliance, ensuring end-to-end -end everything is done. They don't consider the human aspects of the team or the stakeholders. Whereas um, a leader is somebody who focuses on it and leverages that human potential to the project's benefit. So that is the aspect here which needs to be done. Tailoring. Now tailoring is a big, big topic in seventh uh, edition. So it is one of the guiding principles and it has also a separate section devoted to it in the box, in the PM box, where they talk about elaborately on why tailoring, what is tailoring about it, how you should do, what are the various aspects of tailoring, how do you right size things for you. Now, I'm sure all of you would have done this, would have experienced this at some point of time while you are executing your projects. So what is the bottom line there? The bottom line is to choose the right amount of processes, methodologies, everything which you decide. Now, how, how do you decide what is the right size? So there are a lot of parameters which you would consider. The strategic importance of the project, the, the value of the total uh, duration of the project, the complexity of the project, various factors will decide what do you mean by what is the right thing for you? How much is right? How much is too much for you or how or are you doing too little? So arriving at the right balance is all about tailoring. I don't say that you do it right on day one, but as you learn, you need to take quickly, incorporate those changes quickly. If you realize that you are doing too much, cut down on those. If you see that you are missing out on some things, quickly add up and scale up quickly on those things. So that is the key um, attribute of a good project manager, how quickly you are able to determine those things. The number eight principle talks about building quality into processes and deliverables. Now here, the focus is not on looking at quality as a standalone function. Now the 
the discussions are all driving towards giving first time right and ensuring there is quality all through the life cycle no need to have separate quality teams quality checks to be done quality control processes because everybody has learned the lessons the hard way the quality control alone doesn't solve the problem quality assurance is building assurances into the product right from the beginning adds more value so that is the goal and uh, it also adds up to the last line what is written there about eliminate and reduce waste because in quality control you end up creating waste when you reject rejections are all part of that so how do you contribute to that is by building quality right away from step 1 or from day 1 of your product navigating complexity now this is nothing new which you are all familiar with but this is one of the guiding principles further so this talks about the integration across the various domains when we come to domains you will understand what we talk about here and also how do you manage risks effectively so those two aspects together talks about complexity here in your project one of all first of all you need to understand and recognize the level of complexity the second thing is then proactively decide how do i navigate now the navigation talks about being successful in the project execution and the project life cycle so we don't say you can eliminate complexity that is so that means in in other words i cannot eliminate risks in a project i understand that there will be risks i understand there will be challenges i acknowledge that but i try to keep that to the minimum the surprises which comes up should be limited to the minimum which i can which helps me to stay in control so a corollary to that is optimizing the risk responses so how do i maximize the positive opportunities which comes my way and how do i minimize the challenges which comes through from the negative aspects of risks so those are the these two are correlated collaborative features the next ones the last two ones are embracing the adaptability and resilience so this is an expectation of a project manager nowadays as a role if you are performing we can't be rigid in our thoughts we can't be uh, we need to be flexible we need to understand things change not just daily it changes even during the day the complexity of the project changes the complexion of the project changes right from the morning to by the end of the day things would have changed so badly so how do you respond to it how quickly how do you manage so this is where you also demonstrate your leadership trait one of the leadership traits is being resilient being adaptable and how do you respond quickly and take your team along while doing so and the last aspect is enable change to achieve future state so here the the messaging here is don't be resistant to change we we need to welcome change because the project itself is a product of change every project which we execute is because of a change which has been triggered and projects are change agents hence it is important to recognize that and say yes changes are welcome but changes are welcome not to the detriment of execution of the project the question is how do you manage it so that's what here is enable change to achieve the future how do you bring about um, accept those changes accommodate these changes without losing focus on the objectives of the project let me take a pause here any any questions or anything before we move on so these are the primary uh, foundations i would say as pm box 7 these 12 principles okay any questions post so, uh, let me ask because some people often get confused with the because the still the mindset is of sixth edition and this is a seventh edition is a kind of transpose kind of things somewhat yeah. like that so how this is mapped to things in uh, sixth edition so we we can't do the mapping between sixth and seventh that way okay so the way it has been written is uh, in sixth edition if you remember the, the biggest the quick picture which anybody would recall is you go through any knowledge area you pick up scope time schedule uh, cost anything you always see a summary page 
which talks about okay generally what is the knowledge area about if i am talking about scope what does scope mean what is the scope baseline those things we talk about and then we show three uh, tables there which talks about the inputs then we talk about the the processes in between the techniques which we use so the transformation which happens to those inputs and then okay what are the outputs you get out of that knowledge area now the the challenge in that way of understanding project is it, it's a discrete way of looking at each compo component there you understand scope separately you understand time separate uh, time separately that is schedule then you go to risk you understand it separately as an individual topic you understand but you we forget that it is always an integrated thing scope time cost risk quality everything go hand in hand when you are executing project you can't look at it in a in a separate bucket you can't bucket it that is the challenge so the way it was written was from a prescriptive or you know like you could say in our school curriculum each subject we say each chapter how it is written so that is how it was presented now the change has happened because they have accepted that there is no way of doing it that way that is the basic foundation is over but when you are doing it in real life you can't do it in separate chapters there you can't say the question comes from this chapter or that chapter no. so your project is executed in real time putting up at a mix of all these things together in addition to it there are other factors like your the pesil so where do we talk about that the political economic social um, all those environmental factors which play a big role in determining the changes in which things move they influence a lot your stakeholders what happens to that so that is the challenge which they saw and they decided to move it to one level higher instead of bringing it further breaking it so that's how they have moved it so these principles are like uh, umbrella things uh, applicable to everything going into the project correct this is how the the standards uh, is built around it i have a question got a question here in the chat yeah. box it says in one of the principle it is said that first time right i mm. see this con contradict with the agility mm. focus isn't it if we want to be agile then we need to go fast with the best solution is that approach we cannot have a mindset that first time it will be right isn't it so my friend here the objective of first time right means what at the time of even in agile you have something in mind to deliver you have to create some outputs so can you create that outputs correctly that is the goal that was the problem there are correctly in the sense what in understanding from the scope perspective from its functionality perspective the product or the service whatever you are trying to deliver that is the meaning of first time right whatever was given to you at that point of or given to me at that point of time am i doing it correctly am i giving scope to some errors some leakages are there defects in my product or deliverable which i am making so that is the goal there so whether it is agile or waterfall or any methodology my responsibility is i i need to do things correctly whatever i do correctly in the sense it should be functioning right and completely that's what is the meaning there two aspects are there. did i complete the deliverable and secondly did i do it correctly both aspects are there. yeah so i i i add to this this is a very good question actually people often they this confusion is quite there actually so when we say first time right it is actually referring to the quality of what we are producing yeah that it should be defect free it's not about that you should have everything in the first day so what agile says that you do not produce everything in the first place so you pr you produce a suppose you have to produce 10 things so produce one thing at a time and take 10 iterations to complete the product so in the first iteration you you produce uh, the the functionality one then there should be no defects in it actually so that is the first time right so when we talk about mvp or mbi in agile yeah. does it meet that objective that is what it means whatever that objective was minimum viable product or a minimum business value addition what you talk about does it really deliver that was the question if we don't do that then we end up doing rework around it so we don't meet those targets that was the the goal of um, delivery here when we talk 
Yeah. Uh, one more point, Kalyan. Uh, it seems that uh, this uh, standard uh, PM book uh, seventh edition is more about strategic aspects. And uh, as an individual project manager, one may require to follow PM BOK's uh, uh, sixth edition as well, uh, when actual actual work uh, will be required. Because if I can't uh, find my project duration by just suppose I, I have not read any of the previous uh, PM PM book, and I'm directly referring to this seventh uh, edition. Which are the tools that I can use uh, for uh, maybe risk management, maybe uh, critical path? Those are the work instructions or or the templates which are not there in the in the seventh edition. It, it is there. So I, this is just a starting which I have talked about. I have just talked about now at this point the foundation on which this book is written. These are the founding principles on which it is written. So the next part is going to be using these, based on these 12 principles, PM Bok has written eight performance domains. Now that is where all your questions will get answered. We'll come to that. So there are eight performance domains which are there built on these. And then this is going to come afterwards, the tools and artifacts, the supporting things also we will come to. So those are all the big changes which have happened. And it is complete. Uh, bear with me for a few minutes. We will definitely cover that. Topic. Got another question. Yeah. Only, only PM, PM box seven. seven is enough for PMP exam. The answer is no. Answer is grossly no. Huh? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> because it, PM has clearly said that PM box seven is not a prescriptive book. So that's where I told you clearly. So the good analogy for you was, if I had to write a school exam. I study the class book, a textbook, and then say, okay, this is where my curriculum or my syllabus is. So that is not say not the case now in PM Box 7. That was the case till PM Box 6. But now for PM Box 7, that is not the case. You can refer to a lot of other material. You may read other material because they want you to learn from other sources also, not just PM Box 7. PM Box 7 is a guide explaining how the standard has been built. Now, you have to learn things. Then when you go through the course, the, the ATP is there. That is the authorized training partners. We'll use other material also to give you hands-on exercises, real-time scenarios, and talk about it. See, very importantly, the examination itself is not talking about a prescriptive way. It's all about situational-based questions. I'll talk cover that at the end of the session today. Please bear with me on that. We'll talk about it. Okay, good, interesting. Some questions have come up about principles and that's, this is what I wanted to know. Have people understood it? Are they grasping what is the change? So this is a big change. It needs a change from our thought process also. It's no longer the textbook model which we had earlier. So as Vivek mentioned, we have been seeing this evolution from version PM Borg edition two, three onwards till seven now. So a lot of things have changed as we go along. So I'm moving on to the next topic, which is now how we build those, identify those domains using these principles, and then how do I deliver the projects? So what are those domains which I have to look at? So there is a picture which talks about it, and I'll walk you through all that. So again, these pictures are from PM Bob only, because it helps me to bring the context right there. So I have summarized all those principles on the left, the 12 principles which they had listed. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, my friend, about exams. We will cover that. So these founding principles, 12 principles there, now filter down further into your domains. Now, which are the project performance domains? As a project manager, when I perform, what are those areas which I have to look into? So you start from the stakeholders. That's the, as the, as the clock, if you look at it, start from 12 o'clock there, you start moving towards the right. So stakeholders, the people who are involved, who are, who is the stakeholder community in your project? The next is the performing team. So these two play a big role. Now, so what is expected here? First is as a project manager, you need to be aware of the stakeholders, need to do the stakeholders analysis. So the book talks about all that stuff in detail. 
in the performance in the stakeholders domain what all things you expected to do what does this domain mean how is it important then what are the tools available for you to identify the stakeholders how do you do the stakeholder analysis how do you measure that what are the uh, impact of it on the other performance domain how does that influence the others all that stuff is explained so one key uh, aspect of your project is the stakeholders community the second key aspect is the team the performing team your performing team the team with which you are delivering the project is one of the key pillars of success for you so understanding the team knowing the team dynamics how do you motivate them how do you keep them engaged how do you measure their performance how do you translate their performance into results how do you ensure close collaborations with other teams so all that stuff is covered in this year so the hr aspects earlier which was there in the 6th edition is now covered here in the team performance domain so all about motivation theories all those theories are all talked about there um, the tucker model of forming storming norming all that stuff everything is covered under this domain then it also talks about the importance of this or the influence of this across the others so if you look at it across uh, the team plays a big role in your deciding your development approach and life cycle what how good is your team what kind of a development life cycle will you choose so if you see some what you say nuances of changes which you see here earlier we used to go with development life cycle first then we could go about staffing the team accordingly now the focus here is first understand your team and then decide how the how do you want to do the development because your team availability the staffing determines what kind of a life cycle would you adopt from a project delivery cycle so this is where the influence of agile is seen here so it influences your project level life cycle and it also tells you how to tailor it based upon your staff now once you decide these two then comes the entire planning aspect the planning based upon given these things for you inputs you are going to decide how are you going to plan and uh, what kind of planning cycles will you go through what kind of planning models will you use how would you carry out the not only planning the feedback mechanism after planning you need to track and then replan manage your risks all that stuff. so those four parts are the initial components now if you look at the fifth part onward which is the project work clock in the clock it is six so if you see that midway midway stage the project work is what the actual execution part how the team performs the various teams perform not only your team if you have got your vendors if you have got other teams customer teams you too you have to collaborate all the teams so the entire project work component is taken care of so if i were to map this year to your sixth edition your execution process group if you understand execution process group that's what this talk the project work all the various uh, aspects of execution there because after planning you say you will have uh, these inputs you will perform these tasks and then you will report you will update various artifacts that's what is project work is all about now the delivery is the next aspect is completion of project work in an iterative form gives rise to various deliverables so that's what is delivery there. the outputs which you create which you generate throughout your project life cycle it can be various artifacts i am not referring to only deliverables it could be various documents mid stage things which you which you produce all of them comes under a delivery then the next aspect is how well do you perform so the data driven models of performance comes through where you talk about answer measurement so the measurement aspects do all those measurement decide what are the metrics you want figure how and when you want to measure it up to what levels you want to measure it measuring alone is not enough analyzing it taking corrective actions taking preventive actions also if needed to prevent future mistakes future slippages those aspects are covered and the governance aspect around measurement so this goes in hand in hand with your planning so some symbols i have used there just to highlight your process aspects and the people aspects then the last aspect there which is important domain which you see is the uncertain now this relates to your knowledge area of risk if you look at uh, chapter 
PM Work Sixth Edition. And if you look at more specifically the project environment aspect, that is all uncertain. So we are talking about the entire global world is uncertain. The entire project environment is un you you are performing in an uncertain environment. You are never performing in a very stable and uh, a closed environment. Your environment is always unstable. That is the first step we need to understand. Un uh, uncertain in that sense, which means there could be surprises any moment, any day for you. And how do I react to it? So the preparedness for it. How do you keep a watch out for it? What are the various tools you use? What are the various techniques you use to be aware of it? So one of the key aspects of uncertainty is what? Effective communications. How effectively you build that network. Now, many of us misunderstand when I say communication here as you know, reporting. Reporting is not only communication. Communication involves a lot of other things. There are formal communications, informal communications, communication networks which you build in, in your project environment. Have you seen the most important information comes through you, to you through the informal channels first, and then maybe a day later or maybe hours later, you get to know that through the official channels. So that is the power of communication network which you can build. up. Now that you need to use to your benefit, to your positive side, by ensuring that if your communication network is really good, especially with your key stakeholders, you can reduce the level of uncertainty, the risk which you run in your project, because they would give you early warning signals, which can help you to take corrective measures. They would be able to identify those triggers for you and help you to take suitable measures well in advance, not wait for that event to happen or the disaster to happen. That is the power of that network which you build. And that is one of the attributes of a great leader, if you can build that and make it work. So this is all integrated way of looking at it, not just uh, looking at it in each individual silo. So does this answer some of the questions earlier we had about? So these domains, the way you perform these domains, the way you execute your work, has to be built on the foundations which we talked about, the principles. Now, in addition to these principles, there is one thing which I missed out. It is our the code of ethics, which project uh, PMI promotes. That is also part of it, the four pillars of ethics which are there. So those are all built into these principles, and then they are further filtered into your execution process. Now, if you were to study this from your organization perspective, for example, any of you. All of you are working with, with some organizations or other small, big. Look at your way the organization is structured. You have your mission, vision, you have your objectives, and then you have your policies, organizational policies, where how you have to do things. What are the right ways of doing things in your organization? So this is a similar approach which has been adopted. So there are the core values, which is what the ethics, which is there for PMI. They have then defined the guiding principles, the strong foundations of project, successful project. And then they have derived from there the domains on which you have to work, how you will have to do it, what are the best ways of doing it, that is being talked about in the performance. Process. Now, this is not enough. You also need good age to help you to understand, to leverage the best knowledge available, the best practices available in the world. So they have now created a, a great glossary of all those things. I will share in the next few slides, I will talk about that. So I have picked up four specific areas in that PM walk, which they have specifically focused. Okay, before I move on, there is a question here. Seventh edition, differentiated stakeholders and teams separately. Is that we are having more focus on project team or any other team to have this edition? There is nothing different here, my friend. Even in sixth edition, we had stakeholder management as a separate knowledge area. It was already there. In the whole stakeholder community, we identified two which are part of your project team. You yourself as a project manager is one of the key stakeholders. You as a person has a big role to play and you are also 
susceptible to different mood swings so the sponsor has to manage you also that is one important thing the second aspect is the team the project team so recognition that the project team is also a stakeholder helps you to give the right value to them right respect to those team and understand their issues so that is the same thing even now here nothing different it's the same approach which has been taken but when we come to team the difference you will see here is the stakeholder the engagement with other stakeholders as compared to the engagement with your project team there is a huge difference because the time amount of time you invest with your team is many times more than what you invest in with other stakeholders that is the only differentiation and that has been the same case even in sixth edition if you look at it. there is no difference in sixth edition they had talked about it specifically as the hr aspects the motivation aspects people management component which was addressed there here we are not looking only at that we are talking about uh, people's performance the uh, requirements of people what do you do how do you source them what are the skill sets which you need to take care of and how do you tailor that so those that is how it is being addressed. so as i called out earlier in pm box if you look at the chapters wise it is numbered tailoring process is a specific chapter a lot of effort has been put in there to explain that so let me talk about it <clears throat> i have picked up some inputs from there for you to understand so this is quoted verbatim from from the book so what is the meaning of tailoring as defined in pm box 7 so that talks about understanding the project context and applying it deciding these are the driving factors for tailoring according to pmi when you decide to tailor what is it that you do you have to look at delivering quickly minimize the cost optimize the value delivered providing also ensuring that you stay compliant with all those things and adapt to change now what will you tailor now these are the goals of tailoring what will you tailor is what i have listed below the components which you can tailor would be your project life cycle which ones you want to do you may not necessarily go through the entire life cycle you may decide okay whatever is applicable to your project you may say i can pick up some or delete some of it then the development approaches which you want the various processes which you want to adopt or you may want to um, not necessarily take the whole hog decide to do the minimum where required the tools methods and artifacts i'll elaborate on these uh, which is a separate topic for you anyway as a separate slide so these are the components which you can tailor what is the meaning of tailoring make it fit for purpose not fit for the project it's fit for purpose is the important understanding whatever you do should fit the purpose of the project and meet the goals of the project if you can do that you are halfway through that's what the purpose the de simple definition of tailoring means the second topic is what about models methods and artifacts now here our friend talked about what are the aids available how will you understand what you need to do so pmi has actually generated a huge list of three things models methods and artifacts now models talks about the higher level thinking which is the initial part of the project methods talks about the what part of it the how it has to be done that is how it is then the artifacts are the various deliverables which you use the various documents and other things which you use so they have created a big list of all of them they have compiled all the good things which are available in the world as of that date when the publication happened and they have given references to all those readings so i have picked up some snapshot of it for you to help you to relate to it i'll walk you through that for example when you look at the table of methods see the interesting thing here how it is represented it is not just listing the model it is also telling you in which performance domain this will be applicable for you. so this has life made life very easy for a practitioner so we just talked about those eight performance domains now what pmi has done is compiled all these things and then mapped it to say that for example your oscar model is applicable for your team domain it is applicable for your project work now the gulf of execution and evaluation is a model which is applicable for delivery the 
for your project work hygiene and motivation factors are applicable it is also applicable for your team so you can relate to all these things communication models they are all applicable to your stakeholder community so they have done all this now this page is not enough i have just taken a snapshot there is a big list in that book so the moment you browse through it you can see the benefit of this what and some of them are also explained in that book not just listed it so that is a big big plus there which uh, which was missing in the earlier editions so i'll show you similar things about the the next few examples around the model source so we talked about methods models and artifacts so second page is about models so here what are the models he talks about let us take some examples see for estimation which is applicable in your planning domain affinity grouping function point analysis parametric estimation single point estimation then you talk about in delivery kick off meeting lessons learned then in case of project close out when all will you do project close out you will do in the team domain you would do with the stakeholder domain you would involve the delivery part also so these are all ways where you can see where this gets applied now the last part is the artifacts so the third out of the three now artifacts example business case the business case document is created with whom with the stakeholders and it is also done in your planning domain then what about your logs and register artifacts backlog change log it all works under delivery and it also comes assumptions log you can see one stand out there comes under uncertainty which is in part of your project charter which is part of your risk management plan all that stuff which you if you can relate to the earlier edition so risk register comes under uncertainty under delivery project work planning all these areas this is applicable the stakeholder register is applicable not only in stakeholders but also in plan so this is how the full list is given there i would urge you to go through that because this is the best part for you the big value add coming from that book for you so kg sir does this answer some of the questions yes uh, this answers few of the questions but formats are missing in the standard so one has to refer to internet or some other books for formats yeah that is true they have given all those references also there where the additional reading references all that stuff is mentioned the formats maybe will be available if you go to that pmi standards plus the portal which i talked over there right. everything is available so they are encouraging us to go through the portal and browse through that library there the resource library the whole thing is available it seems this seventh edition is uh, is really inspired by the agile manifesto agile principles and artifacts i can see the lot of common terminologies like retrospective and artifacts which are used in agile yeah they have imbibed a lot of it of agile in this delivery now lot of yeah. that so these were number 2 which i talked about then number 3 is the, the topic is around sponsor now earlier in till 6th edition if you see we used to hear a word called sponsor we never knew much about that role about that entity what needs to be done who is it and all that so here they have devoted a separate section explaining the roles of that sponsor explaining the roles and responsibilities also what he or she is supposed to do right from the project inception till the end of the project and also what kind of uh, so how do you become a facilitator how do you become a project uh, become a uh, big factor influencer for project success and they have also listed what will happen if sponsors behaviors is also there there are various examples of sponsor behaviors written there that is the con side of it if a sponsor doesn't take care what happens what are the issues which could be faced by the project team and the project manager if the sponsor is not uh, responsive he is not taking suitable care of the project doesn't help you with the resourcing doesn't become the spokesperson for you with the management so those are all the aspects which they have listed which i felt was a is a good good addition today because the understanding of this role was always a challenge for people as to who is this sponsor what is the role they have to play all that stuff in simple terms your reporting manager the, man, the person to whom you report to as a project manager is your sponsor so that entity has got the authority to 
facilitate the project for you make it much more easier for you when you talk about bottlenecks just like people come to you for bottlenecks in the project when you uh, face issues which are beyond your authority you need somebody to help you out so that is the role of that sponsor and that is very well articulated in this particular edition now which is uh, reference is given there as appendix 2 that's what i have mentioned there <clears throat> and one of the big changes in uh, this particular edition has been the move from outputs to outcomes that is the value system delivery now this is driven by a new thought process which is seen in project management is adopting the product life cycle we are not talking about a project life cycle we are being asked to think about from a product life cycle now why this change has happened if you look around yourself how are the products and services being delivered to you how are the things packaged now for you as a customer even if you buy any home appliance for example what does it come up the seller doesn't sell you only that appliance he is keen to sell you so many accessories he is keen to sell you even the, the support part of it the warranty side beyond the warranty not just the warranty extended support the service component of it comes into it not just the product part itself so this aspect of business has been addressed by pmi by talking about projects being looked into not just from a small smaller view don't take a smaller view of your project take a bigger view of your project and see how it adds value to your organization if you care to look at it from a product life cycle so the objective here is to retain customers so how do you do that customer once gain has to be there with you for life so how do you do that you don't give only one service or one product and say okay this is the end of the story the engagement doesn't end there you need to build on it and see what all other uh, ancillary services services which you can add on what are the complementary products which you can sell those aspects is what is being highlighted here when they talk about product life cycle and that has been addressed in appendix 4 it's it's an interesting read there it tells you to think beyond the project right now so when you talk about <coughs> value addition and outcomes which being talked about okay is sponsor executive or non executive function can you explain what is the meaning of executive non executive here we are talking about if i understand it correctly this is an executive function it is not a non executive it is you you as a project manager has to report to the sponsor the reporting authority who to whom our you are answerable to so it can't be a non executive function the escalation mode for you who is the first escalation point for you as a project manager is the sponsor within the performing organization <clears throat> sorry to interrupt so so these are some of the you know interesting and uh, exciting changes i would say because i can see pmi taking a sincere effort to align with uh, with the changing world with the changing landscape which we see around us so uh, definitely i am happy with the way it has been presented of course the only drawback i would say is it's no longer prescriptive it is not the bible now for you if if somebody is looking at it from the examination standpoint yeah so i am coming to that topic now let me take a pause before i go to the exam any other questions regarding pm box content and all that stuff let me address it and then let's take up can we say pm box 7 is a strategic project management aspect and uh, pm box 6 is a tactical or operational uh, project management it was technical and uh, tactical yes that was more it was more hands on skill 6 it was like you know uh, the doer aspect of it that's a project manager what all things you need to do was being talked about there. so here they moved it one step higher and said not just doing we want to look at it from a higher picture and talk about all those things which you need to be aware of so the only thing i would say missing still i am finding it is the the initiation phase where i felt the project manager still has a role to play though not yet nominated as a project manager that process is that part is still not covered for them the project still starts only from the project is ready and born from the contract 
right so that part is still missing uh, i think uh, just just to add into that what pmi says that they have gone on some like value based standard so process earlier the uh, the framework was of process driven actually now they say is it is a value driven one and that's why those principles have been kept into the standard and this performance domain have been kept in the uh, guide actually yeah, it is in the guide yeah so so if you look at the standard standard is value driven only principles are there now how to implement project management that is through the guide and that's talk about the performance domain and it is expected that when you are having a performance domain you like you are you are executing project in that performance domain you take care of all 12 principles whatever applicable to that particular domain yeah that's right vivek but uh, when you say any standard let's say technical standard uh, or a, even iso standard standard has to be prescriptive because then only the people who are adopting those standards people who are on the ground who are applying the standards they have uh, they can standardize on uh, execution and implementation so this thought process is welcome it is much needed as a strategic aspect but how can a standard is uh, without a prescription and uh, even earlier also ag the challenge has been they have never said that this is the only way of doing things they have said that this is a guide this is a best practice which we are recommending it's up to you so that's where the tailoring aspect they talk about a lot they said this is the guide for you this helps you to talk about what is available what should be the right way of doing things but you use your own judgment as to what is right how much of it does it suit you everything is uh, because each project is unique and uh, situation is different so they leave it open that they don't prescribe anything there for you that has been there earlier also they never have prescribed anything yes, what so they have that. talked about is in the process knowledge areas part they have prescribed in each knowledge area yes this will be the input that will be the output that is all they prescribed earlier they did not prescribe that this is how you have to do it no <clears throat> so uh, as as the pmi defines the standard is something like which is what what you should do not how you should do when it is say how you should do is say it is a methodology and that is one of the differentiation uh, which have been highlighted on a continuous basis between the prince 2 and pmp the prince do is a kind of methodology because it's it's a very prescriptive you should do this and as it is defined you should do that but the stand as a standard pm ball they say we we define what to do how you do this you decide your own way you can decide your own way and two people can do it differently but these should be the constituents or this should be the component or we should take care of these things this is this is how the pmi defines it right when you say how you do it you decide the problem is the project manager and the team and the stakeholders everybody should understand it that's where documentation comes in or communication as to how this is what is the common understanding this is how we will deliver it. so <clears throat> there is a, that is that open ended thing they have kept it there that has been consciously done they have not changed that okay so because what i see a problem is from the audit point of view because in any organization uh whenever we do process audit or whenever we try to see whether the company or a or a team is following certain processes or not if uh, certain prescriptive uh, you know, formats are not mentioned it will be very difficult to do a audit no no that, that no, no the keter uh, i will i will i will take up this actually so uh, like what we do as a as a consultant to the organization that define the processes based on these standards so and even you are doing the same thing i, I as i understand yes right so uh, so the book is a standard like even iso is like that the process consultant actually define the processes 
but they should take care of what ISO talks about it. So ISO never defines that you should do this, this is same as PM walk actually. So we also go and implement the project management, then we define the processes and say, this is how we're going to do the project management. And this is, this is as per the guidance of PMI and, or it's, it's comply with the, with the PM walk. So, uh... Ethan, if you were to elaborate further, if somebody in an organization decides to build their own processes around this, they will create their standards around their own templates and artifacts around it. And automatically people, when they execute, they will comply with it. See, this can't be, this is not meant for a one-off case. So when you Most start of the off, time, we are defining the templates as per yeah. the customer requirement, actually. So we, we provide the template, we tailor them, we define them. In fact, many, many templates have come all, all over the new because a very unique requirement customer has. So, I appreciate the discussions. These are really useful. Challenges. How do there are some questions that? related to exam also. So yeah, yeah, I think when you are going to that, switch yeah. to that, yeah, yeah, please answer them also. Yeah. We are going to move to that examination. Yeah. Into that topic. There is one slide I have kept for that. I anticipated that and I have kept a slide there. For that. I believe there will be some questions around it. Okay, before I go through this exam perspective, people had questions around. So the basis for your exam is not necessarily only PM Box 7. PM Box 7 is a guide. There are other reading materials. Lot of stuff is there. I can't list out all the names here for you. There are many good books available. Whatever. So when you go through the course, people will recommend to you or you can be part of any discussion group. You can connect to us. We will help you with that as to what books will be relevant for you based upon your level of understanding. We can definitely help you. Now, since the PM Box 7 edition has been released, the examination pattern also has changed. So we are just summarizing that for your benefit. So the number of questions now is 180. The multiple choice options still remain the same. That has not changed. The time duration is now four hours. And it is split up with a break of 10 minutes, which are allowed for two breaks are allowed of 10 minutes each. Do not worry that 10 minutes break is not counted. That is outside. <clears throat> now the examination is now divided into three sections. So that's why you get two breaks accordingly. But you will be forced to submit your responses after every 60 questions. So that is a block of 60 questions in which you will have to submit. So you cannot go back after you submit that block of 60. Why? What I mean by going back is the feature of review is available in your PMI exam. You can mark your questions, your responses against your questions that I am sure and I, or I may want to review certain answers. So the questions which you mark for review can be limited to only to a block of 60 because once you submit that 60, you cannot go back. So you have to be careful in what you do and how you plan your time. <clears throat> but the experiences so far says people have been able to complete their exams well in time. They have had enough time to do it and all have been happy with that. Then the, the way the examination questions are. Now this is different because earlier you had all those knowledge areas. We used to tell you numbers by knowledge areas, 5%, 10%, 12% and all that stuff. Now it has been distributed amongst the three pillars of project management, which is people, process and environment. Now, especially if you see people has got the highest numbers, uh, second highest 42%. Processes has the highest number as 50% and environment has got around 8%. So there is a question around, is it 60 minutes or 60 questions? It is 60 questions split into three blocks. There are 180 questions. So around 75 minutes. Uh, so it is 60, so at an interval of 70, 75 minutes. So there is an error here. I, I will correct it and send it when I publish. So. It's an interval of each 60 questions. So the, the examination pattern so far, what we have seen is, this is how the distribution looks like. Again, this is an indicative number. People 42, process 50 and business eight. It could vary by a couple of percentages because these are all uh, coming from a random question bank to you. So you don't, I can't say for sure how many of them are for what, but 
the big change has been it is the questions are not prescriptive the questions are not directly from the book as we call earlier so the lot of questions are all situation based questions which you experience in your day to day life that is how the questions will be so the challenge is the questions could be each question would be five lines 10 lines or something there will be lot of options given you will have to read it and then decide the right answer so invariably you need time to do that so the only advice we give always is do practice you do at least two to three mock tests with the timing you time your test so that you practice it and you understand and improve on that as you go ahead and then you feel confident about it when you finally appear for the exam so that has been the experience which various uh, students have shared with us and i have a better pe- person here than me to answer this vivek here who has been a very successful trainer and uh, very much looked for his training by all the people around here i'll ask him to answer any questions about this more specifically i just give one clarification that the section are divided by the questions not by the time so if you take 60 minute you can take 60 minute you can take 70 minute you can take 80 minute you can take 90 minute but you are consuming time from your 3 230 minutes so once you submit the first set of questions of 60 60 questions then your break starts actually so it is not limited to time that's I just wanted to clarify probably this may get confused that okay the se- the first session is for 75 minute it's not like that so it, so therefore the time is not mentioned generally so it is 60 questions not the 60 minutes actually because uh, i think there's some uh, yeah, it's a type it's a type on that i will correct yeah, yeah, yeah. so essentially what so, is it? if you finish your first section early you get that much time more for the second or the third section that's how it is right 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 or if you consume more time in the first then maybe you are under pressure around the second and the third one that's all so you have to be balancing it so there are some question which probably i will try and uh, kalyan you add into that uh, i just forgot to tell that kalyan is also trainer with us and he is also certified pmp trainer in fact he doesn't need certification the kind of experience he has and kind of classes he have taken in his almost 30 years of 30 more than 30 years of life of corporate life as such so uh, when will the exam be conducted including pm box 7 the pm box 7 is already already been considered but uh, pmi has announced a change in the pmp exam from the first quarter of 2023 so and the mainly the changes will be incorporating uh, com- pm box completely in the in the exam so still the pm box 7 will stay is still remain the is still remain the one of the reference book uh, now one question was there that Uh, can you tell the question with the books which are which will be referred if pm box is not enough so yes so pmi has listed around 10 books on his uh, on its uh, website that they can be referred but i think for anybody who is who's for targeting pm uh, the pmp exam it will be too much exercise so few things are important good few things uh, like uh, one is uh, there are training material when we conduct the training we get the training material from pmi and we also have a training material so that training material can be used for preparation if you have uh, done the training you must be having that training material with you so that will be the best method to do plus the uh, plus the question set which is generally are uh, some are available in public domain some are uh, not may not be available so good generally a very good quality questions are not available so many in the public domain so but that's fine so you can refer some training material you can refer some pmp exam prep but unfortunately there are not many uh, many books as such in the in the in the market pmp prep which are actually aligned with the all the latest changes in pmp but but they give you a, a good good idea that how the exam will happen so uh, 
ATP is a, a good option in that case. And uh, what is the other questions actually? From, uh, so April, I will talk about you, you can expect that from uh, first quarter of 2023, the PM box, everything will only book, which will be like PM box six or seven, only PM box seven will be referred. And all these principles, question related to principles or performing domain, probably be in the around that will be in the exam. Is a sponsor executive, non-executive function. So Kalyan can answer this question, I think. B, your point is right. It is no longer prescriptive now, seven edition onwards, more of a practical and experience based. So you need to focus on those questions and it's more like being, you know, applying common sense to it. That's where the questions are. Situation based. Uh, I am in a situation, this is, or this is a monetary value. What will that look like? If there is a conflict, how do I resolve it? So those kind of questions are typically asked around. Okay, so uh, one question is there, Kalyan, is a sponsor executive or non-executive function in the context? I addressed that, I have addressed that. Uh, you already addressed it, okay, okay. okay. Is 60 or 60 questions actually. Earlier PMP exam were more prescriptive and even evaluations were focused more on the approach defined in the book, less on the practical experience. So the right now answer is more focus on experience than the book definition. That, that has been addressed. Let's look at the next one. Kiran has asked about promotes lateral and out-of-box thinking, value-based, team-focused, dynamic process. Yeah. So, you are right, Kiran. It's not about only thinking out-of-the-box or anything. Based on the situation there, you will have to respond. And the good part is it's all still multiple choice only. You are not, we don't have to write any essay to that response there. We have to, the best way to look at these questions and answers is look at the options given as answers evaluate them and then go back to the question. That's how, that is the trick we, we have learned how to handle it better. It will come with practice as you go through the process of training and practice sessions, you will understand how that. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we are approaching uh, to an end of this webinar. Uh, let me just summarize. Uh, uh, what uh, Kalyan has uh, shared. Uh, Kalyan, first of all, thank you very much for saving at least my 10 days of time of going through each and every line of the standard because you have explained so well and you have covered almost all the topics like why new additions are created, uh, what is there in the new addition, what is the difference between six and seven addition, the structure and the focus areas, then uh, knowledge areas uh, related to performance domains, uh, focus on value delivery system. So much you have covered in just 90 minutes. Uh, so heads up to you and thank you very much. I think uh, this uh, program is really valuable. Today's session is valuable for all those who would like to uh, adopt uh, PM book uh, at seventh edition uh, in their day-to-day uh, -day life in near future. So thank you very much. Thank you, KG, for your kind words. And I hope the session has benefited all our people who have participated. Encourage them to participate and suggest topics for us because very soon we will be running short of new topics to talk about. So let's hear from them what they would like to discuss. Let them share some topics uh, for us to even ruminate about what, what all things we can talk about. And consider this as your platform. If you have something to share, you have some ideas, you have some something great work you have done. So share this with other people so that other people can learn from you. And I think it's a good way of getting some, some name and fame as such. And please join us on Facebook, on WhatsApp group, as such, you get the full information from us and uh, let us know what you want to hear from us, what kind of topic you want to cover as Kalyan is already asking. And this is this will be really amazing we, to see people, uh, we, if we can include those subjects which people are especially interested in. Thank you very much for your time and coming over here. Thank you all for your patience.